something in the tick. This meeting is being recorded. Hi, I'm Brian Schrader. This is a Reason Faith Adelaide. And I'll be speaking on the subject of well, looking at the point of view of the Bible and at a how it points to a recent creation, relatively speaking. As with anything along this line, I can really only skim the surface of that. Uh, so there'll be a lot that I will not be um, able to say because there just isn't time. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we believe in God. As one of the earliest and most fundamental of the creeds begins, I believe in God, the Almighty, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And believing in this God, we believe that the Bible is God breathed, as it says itself in uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. And it is given to us by God as the primary and prime source for our faith, for understanding and for truth. And Jesus in the gospel certainly treated the scriptures this way. That being said, I'm not here looking at how this happened or at theories of inspiration. Uh, just suffice it to say that we do not believe that uh, the Bible is divinely dictated to those who wrote it down word for word. But the Holy Spirit of God was directly involved at every point in the writing, the collecting, the collating, the editing, and the putting together of what we have. And according to this understanding, all truth is God's truth. And science is merely thinking God's thoughts after him, as the scientist Johannes Kepler put it, seeking to understand what God has created. And Francis Bacon uh, spoke of God's two books, the written book of scripture and the unwritten book of nature. And his con conjecture was that we need to read both of those together to get the fullest and best understanding. Uh, thus, when looking at the biblical basis for believing the earth to be relatively young, we are not seeking to put a holy book ahead of the facts, to ignore the science, to deny the truth, but something else entirely. As with the fathers of modern science, we simply seek the whole truth, which we believe can be better found from both books and not just one of them. And for a bit more on that subject, I spoke on the... Um, Christian Roots of Modern Science a couple of years ago, and the video for that can be found on our YouTube channel. And it's also worth noting that when we talk about young earth or old earth, these are relative terms. For example, 80 years old is ancient for a five-year-old, and 15 billion years is infinitesimally young compared to eternity. Now, there are many scientists who reject the first book completely, that is the written book. Plus, there are a goodly number of those who, to varying degrees, accept both. And these all believe that the universe is, again, to varying degrees, self-made over eons of time. There are also many scientists, leaders in their field with multiple PhDs, who believe the universe to be relatively young, in accord with their understanding of the Bible. Both of God's two books are available and open to all. Both must be interpreted. So in this talk, I will concentrate on God's written book to see what it has to tell us. Now, hermeneutics is the study of how to interpret a written work, the Bible in this instance. And way number one, we could look at it in a totally literal manner and interpret it that way. Now, no one actually is quite that silly, but many do fail to understand genre or context and literalize far too much. Allegorical interpretation, and this was particularly championed by the school of Alexandria around about 200 AD. And for the full story of that, again, that's a full story in its own right. Uh, but it was particularly important to them at that time. And for them, the straightforward meaning of the text is irrelevant and unimportant. What is important is the hidden meaning the surface text is trying to convey. 
And for a simplified example of allegorical interpretation, consider Aesop's fables, uh, where the boy who cried wolf is uh, probably one of the more famous. Or a spiritual interpretation. Forget what it says. What spiritual message is it trying to convey between the lines? Again, the straightforward meaning is irrelevant. It is there to convey a spiritual truth. For example, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in Acts 2 is said to be the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to come again. And having the sun created on day four in Genesis 1 is simply making the point that the sun is not God. Or we could interpret according to genre. And there are many different genres in the Bible, including history, poetry, wisdom, biography, law, allegory, analogy, teaching, prophecy, apocalyptic, personal letter, and more. So basically this means that we are seeking to understand how the original authors intended it to be seen, what they wanted to convey. convey. And most disagreements on interpretation stem from variations in hermeneutics. Almost all serious Christians go for one or four here. And wherever they start out of these two, almost all of them gravitate to four, which I believe is the only one that is ultimately valid. Now, allegorical and spiritual interpretations can be worthwhile, useful and instructive, but only when it is understood that those interpretations are secondary and not what the authors intended. But even after all of that, there can be disagreements on assigning genre. For example, Genesis chapters 1 to 11 can be viewed in a number of different ways, including history and narrative, where the, that is the straightforward reading of what is there, or poetry or myth, telling the story in a colorful and possibly fanciful language and imagery. It is not to be taken seriously as written, but it still conveys an underlying truth. Another problem, of course, is language. Now, there is the initial obvious issue of translating from the ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek into, into modern English or whatever other language we want to translate into. But there are also other problems, such as understanding culture, dialect, and idiom. And just as an example, um, today in modern English, Americans often have trouble understanding Australian terms. Plus there is the significant problem of unstated and assumed background knowledge. That is, there are some things that the original readers would simply be assumed to know as common knowledge. And these things would therefore not be stated or explained. But today, we now have no idea. Thus, gaining a full understanding is an ongoing job. Christianity is not based on a philosophy or on the teachings of a great sage. It is explicitly based on history and historical truth. If the events described did not happen, then everything based on them collapses into nothing. Consider, for example, this passage from the New Testament where the Apostle Paul writes, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand firm. By this gospel, you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one of untimely birth. For I am the least of the apostles, and am unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not in vain. No, I worked harder than all of them, 
yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is worthless, and so is your faith. Our faith is not based on allegory or parable. If the foundation given in Genesis is not real, then the structure built on it similarly collapses. And for most of known history, no biblical scholar interpreted the Bible as teaching long ages, but only as teaching a relatively recent creation. This includes Eastern as well as Western scholars. It is only since the 19th century that some have felt the need to make the scriptures conform to the tenets of naturalism and uniformitarianism. And so far as invoking cultural understanding is concerned, the author of Hebrews in the New Testament is clearly somewhat immersed in the Old Testament scriptures and in Jewish thought and thought processes and culture and theology. And Hebrews 11 talks about various Old Testament characters from Abel, the son of Adam, through to Samuel, David and the prophets with no difference in terminology. All are assumed to be historical and their stories as given in the Old Testament as historical. Similarly, in Luke chapter three, Jesus' genealogy is traced back to Adam with absolutely zero indication of any change from history to myth at any point. Each person is assumed to be historical. And similar gene genealogical tables in First Chronicles in the Old Testament show that the author of that work also considered Genesis 1 to 11 to be historical. And then Paul, again writing to Timothy, wrote that for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. And the point that he's making in that passage, which is irrelevant to us tonight, nevertheless, his point is pointless unless that is historical fact. Or take Jesus, just a few of the many examples. At one point, some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and sent her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together let man not separate. And Jesus' entire point here hangs on the historicity of those two quotes from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Or again in Luke. This generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Or again, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and been given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So Jesus clearly considered all of it to be historical. Josephus, Josephus was not a Christian. He was a first century Jew. He was raised in a Jewish culture with a Jewish understanding of the culture and language. And he views Genesis one as historical. Although apparently um, he saw part of chapter two as being not so historical, but poetic or allegorical. So in other words, his belief 
Jewish belief is that it was meant to be interpreted literally. Now, whether or not it is literal is another matter entirely, but that was Jewish understanding. And so just got here, uh, the first section, the first bit of um, Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews. That was his magnum opus, I suppose, his prime work, uh, that he gave the history of the Jews from creation right up through to the first century AD. In other words, his time, because he couldn't write anything after that. And the first section of the Antiquities of the Jews was titled From the Creation of the World to the Death of Isaac. So in other words, he was seeing that whole bit as being narrative as history. It didn't suddenly become history with Abraham. It became history at the beginning. And so he finishes that first little bit saying, accordingly, Moses says that in just six days, the world and all that is therein was made. Now the seventh day was a rest and a release from the labor of such operations. Whence it is that we celebrate a rest from our labors on that day and call it the Sabbath, which denotes rest in the Hebrew tongue. Moreover, Moses, after the seventh day was over, begins to talk philosophically. Now, Josephus's work is not scripture, uh, and we do not take it as such, but it does make clear that Jewish thought 2000 years ago was that first 11 chapters of Genesis should be taken literally. Peoples and cultures all over the world have creation stories. For all of them, there was a specific beginning, a specific start for humanity. They also have great flood stories. And so either all these people independently came up with similar stories, or they all relate back to the same particular event. Now, I have read quite a few of these creation and flood stories from all sorts of cultural cultures all over the world, including Australian Aborigines. And of all the ones I have read, the version in the Bible is the most sober, straightforward, and without embellishments. And it is generally considered in any context that the versions that are least outlandish and with the fewest out there details are the ones that are closest to the original facts and to the truth. So does this mean we should say that God created the world in seven days or six days? Well, I know we like to quote a couple of American theologians at some point in my talks, but this time I want to quote an Australian theologian, someone by the name of Ginger Mix. How could God make the whole universe in only six days? Well, the answer is quite simple, really. He was self-employed. And so I think that's about as far as we need to go, but I might continue anyway. The Hebrew word translated day is yom. This is the word used in Genesis 1, and it has near enough the same range of meanings as our word day. So most of the time, it means a simple 24 hour day. But it can also mean daylight hours, such as day and night, for example, or a specific period of time or a longer time. But the context always makes it clear what is meant. So for example, consider this saying, in my grandfather's day, it took six days to do what we can now do in two. So firstly, two meanings of day in that sentence are clear from the context. But also where a number is involved, e.g. six days or the third day or something like that, that always means a standard 24 hour day. And the same applies the yom. Now, James Barr is not a young earth creationist. He believes in long ages, but he wrote, Probably so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 to 11 intended to convey to their readers the ideas that creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience. The figures contained in the Genesis genealogies, provided by a simple addition, 
a chronology from the beginning of the world up to later stages in the biblical story. And Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and to extinguish all human and animal life, except for those in the ark. And in fact, Genesis 1 to 11 uses the same grammatical and literary style as Genesis 12 to 50. It is not poetry. Hebrew poetry has very distinct rules and relies on a lot on various forms of parallelism. All of these are absent in Genesis. And if you want to see a slightly more poetic view of the creation story, some of it appears in Psalm 104. Now, Patelpan is also not a young earth creationist. He also believes in long ages. And he wrote that it is apparent that the most straightforward understanding of Genesis, without regard to the hermeneutical consideration suggested by science, is that God created the heavens and the earth in six solar days. The man was created on the sixth day, and the death and chaos entered the world after the fall of Adam and Eve. And that all fossils were the result of the catastrophic deluge that spared only Noah's family and the animals therewith. In other words, the obvious meaning that the author intended everyone to read is of a literal six day creation and a later literal global flood. So, summarizing this section, the plain and obvious interpretation of Genesis 1 to 11 is the literal one. This is how it has been viewed all along, as in later Old Testament books, in the New Testament, by Jewish scholars all through, and by Christian biblical scholars right up to the 19th century, when some new interpretations started to be introduced. Thus, the onus is on those who want to differ from the orthodox view to prove their position, or at least to prove its probability. Note also that given that all these new views have been shown to have significant faults, quite a few of them have been created. For example, gap theory, framework hypothesis, progressive creation, concordism, myth, allegory, uh, spiritualistic interpretations, day age, day a thousand years, theological polemic, poetry, and so on. Genesis is the basis and foundation of all that is to follow. And Genesis 1 to 11, especially so. It tells us of the origin of the universe, of everything that is, of marriage, of sexual reproduction, that is not asexual or non-sexual, of sin, of death, of salvation, of the concept of a Messiah, of the existence of evil in the world, despite God being good of the Sabbath, of clothing, of carnivory, of the weak, of the equality and differences of the sexes, and more. It tells us of the beginnings of peoples and nations. And there are genealogies frequently in Genesis and then frequently in other parts of the Bible, in both the Old and New Testament. And I mentioned Chronicles and Luke earlier. Do they mean anything or do they not? What indication is there of any change from fact to, to fact to fiction at any point, from human to myth? Or consider the week, seven days. Where did that come from? If God is God, he could have done it in seven millennia or seven months or seven milliseconds or any other time or no time at all. So why seven days? And why the careful and repeated emphasis on each day of the seven days? Consider also the year. That comes from the revolution of the uh, Earth around the sun. Or the month, which is based on the phases of the moon as it orbits the Earth. Or the day, which is based on the rotation of the Earth around its axis. But the week? Across all times and cultures, a seven day week is not universal, but it is extremely common and can be considered the norm. At the end of the six days of creation, 
It says in Genesis that by the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Or in Exodus chapter 20, this is part of the Ten Commandments. This is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your man servant or maid servant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. It's interesting, if you read through the Ten Commandments, most of them are quite brief, such as don't kill, don't steal. But this particular commandment covers quite a few words, a few sentences, and it says a lot. And if the creation story in Genesis chapter 1 is not literal historical fact of literal seven days, then this loses an awful lot of its effect. If they were not literal days, the power and significance of this command would be gone. And just a little side point here, which has got absolutely nothing to do with what I'm saying tonight. But one of the things here is that neither you nor your son or daughter or your manservant or maidservant or anyone is to work on the Sabbath. And so it seems like God is trying to make sure that slaves, servants and employees had at least one day off every week. And aside from cultures that have inherited a Judeo-Christian tradition in some form or other, that is simply unheard of. Death. According to Genesis 1, God's finished creation was very good. In Genesis chapter 3, we have the story of how Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They deliberately did something that God had told them not to do and ate a particular fruit. And that sin then brought in death. Death was not a part of God's good creation. And according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, death came through Adam, a man. Well, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And Paul's point here is hinging on the fact that Adam is one man, Jesus is one man. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, it says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is an enemy. It is to be destroyed. It is not a part of God's design, his good creation. And in fact, in Revelation 21.4 and 22.3, right at the end of the Bible, it says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. No longer will there be any curse. And this is physical death, not just spiritual death, as all the first Corinthians makes clear. But, it's also worth looking at it is spiritual death as well. One of the things that Gordon said last time was that the death that Adam and Eve or, or whoever that was supposed to represent in Genesis experienced was spiritual death. But the problem was he did not explain what that meant. And I suppose that's fair enough. It's not actually easy to define. But look at Jesus' parable in John 15 verses 4 to 6, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If any man remains in me, he will bear much fruit. But if any man is cut off, then he's dead and only useful to be thrown into the fire. So this is an, an analogy that we can use to help understand what spiritual death means. If you walk up to a grapevine at the height of the growing season, it will be lush and green and growing beautifully. If you then cut off a branch, that branch will look lush and green as though it is growing beautifully but it would have been cut off from the source of life, from the sap coming through from the rest of the plant and from the root. 
and give it a couple of days and it will start to look a bit unhappy. Two or three weeks and it will be utterly dead. No good for anything. And it was the same with Adam and Eve. You read the story in Genesis chapter three. As soon as Adam had eaten that fruit, they both felt a significant change. They knew something was significantly wrong. They had died. They were cut off from the source of life. And then ultimately the death worked out in them and they died physically. Consider also someone on death row, sentenced to death, is referred to as a dead man walking. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's being very clear here. Sin came through one man, Adam, and death through sin. But life came through Jesus, again, one man. Then there is the problem of pain. And this is a huge subject in its own right. So this is, again, barely scratching the surface of anything. But if everything was created by an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, all-loving God, why is there evil? How can evil exist? And the orthodox Christian answer is that God made everything good. But we rebelled against God and brought evil, pain and suffering into the world. That God in Jesus Christ came, lived, suffered and died for us so as to reconcile us to himself and to rescue us from sin and death and all their consequences. And so this leads to what we read in places like Revelation chapters 21 and 22, along with other passages in both New and Old Testaments, where we see that God's plan is to totally remove all evil, all death, everything that goes with that, so that evil is no more and life is eternal. People ask, look, the God is such a good God, why doesn't he put a stop to it? On the scale of eternity, God is putting a stop to it very quickly and very soon. But if Genesis 1 to 11 is not true, then that whole narrative collapses. Or salvation. If suffering and death and sin are an integral part of God's good creation, if Adam and Eve did not literally exist and rebel as described, then why did Jesus come? Why did he suffer and die? What is the meaning of the cross, of salvation, of the story and teaching of the New Testament? Oh, but of course, the story of Adam and Eve was only ever symbolic, wasn't it? 
symbolic. So Jesus had himself tortured and executed for a symbolic sin by a non-existent individual. Nobody not brought up in the faith could reach any verdict other than barking mad. So says Richard Dawkins. And personally, I do not take my theology from Richard Dawkins. But he has a point. So in conclusion, Genesis 1 to 11 provides the foundation for everything else. All else that we read in the scriptures is predicated and built on this foundation. If the foundation goes, everything built on it collapses. This is not a scientific question. Some scientists believe that Genesis 1 to 11 is nonsense. Some believe it is historical truth. And both happily interpret their science in accord with their understanding of Genesis. Yeah, of course, there is a range of beliefs between those two extremes, but um, it's fair enough as a summary for that. The real questions are, do you believe the Bible? And how do you interpret the Bible? And with respect to interpretation, both Old Testament and New Testament characters, including Jesus, interpreted Genesis 1 to 11 literally, as did Jewish scholars, church fathers, and theologians for many centuries. Are we that much smarter than all of them? Or were they right? Whatever the position of the scholars themselves, so far as young and old is concerned, and whatever you believe, it is almost universally agreed that the original author intended Genesis 1 to be interpreted as seven literal 24 hour days and Genesis 1 to 11 to be interpreted as historical narrative. And certainly Jesus and other New Testament and Old Testament authors did see it that way. Thank you. Over to you, Kevin. Sorry, I'm a bit slow on controlling <laughs> my audio. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much, Brian. That was, um, um, you presented your case um, very well. Um, but uh, I, I, the only person who's made comments so far is um, on the chat is me. Um, but um, I don't kind of want to step through... Um, um all of my comments so uh, initially uh, we'll ignore me <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so uh, i just uh, um, initially let's just start with uh, responses from the other people so uh, anyone feel free to open up okay i'll say something um yeah, very good brian uh, thank you for your presentation um can I just, uh, I, broadly I agree with what you say, but um, there are a couple of issues uh, still for me. Um, I think you said about death coming into the world. Do you think that Adam's sin brought about not just death for the human race, but for all creation? Or is there a distinction between the animal world and uh, humankind? That one is not quite so clear cut. Uh, the implication in Genesis chapter 3 is that uh, all of that came on all of creation at the time of Adam and Eve's sin as part of the curse that God pronounced over Adam and Eve and creation. There is also the uh, verses in Romans chapter 8, where Paul says that all of creation is uh, groaning and is subject to that, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Yeah, that's true. that's not super clear. Uh, nevertheless, uh, most... Um, interpreters over the centuries have interpreted that to mean all of creation is affected at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tend to concur with that. Um, but like I mm. said, um, it's not quite so clear cut. Mm. Yeah, um, I kind of think that, um, you know, this is again bringing external information into it, um, not directly involved. But when you think about, let's say, for, just for example, a lion. Uh, if you say, well, a lion uh, once did not uh, kill uh, its prey in order to get food, well, why can't a lion just eat grass like animals? 
Yeah, it's not as not so straightforward because it's not just that their teeth are designed for tearing prey, but everything about them, their their jaws, their muscles, and even more than physical things, it's the, the way their brain works, um, that they stalk and they calculate on uh, how to catch their prey, how to work together and co cooperate, cooperate in packs and that uh, in order to get prey. And um, virtually, it's hard to imagine how you could actually, if we were in the place of God, how we could modify a lion so it simply ate grass or something or some vegetation. It just... Um, it's the whole lion seems to be designed from day one to eat prey. And it's not just lions, of course, it's, um, a, you know, a huge amount of the animal creation things eat other things. And, uh, you know, um, ha did that change at the time of man's sin or, or was it always like that? Um, I know there's passages in the Bible that talk about um, in the, in the kingdom age that the lion uh, will eat straw like yeah, the ox and things like that. But that could be, um, that that could actually be a poetic way of, of talking. It could mean that we're, um, particularly about the human world, that people who, who in the human world so often there are people who act like lions and who act like snakes and things like that, they will all be restrained by uh, by Christ and uh, and God's power openly in that. Uh, in that final version of the kingdom, that they won't be able to do that. Everybody, everybody will be safe. Um, it may but not be talked about. Two points, but it's difficult to answer. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm trying to work out where to start with now. Uh, there was quite a lot in no, there. It's rather a lot. All right. Well, let's let's start with um, a, a Jeff's initial point. He's saying that the nature uh, of um, to kill is kind of built yep. in to the to the lion. And so uh, how can you say that um, that the death was introduced? Or, uh, yep. uh, yeah, well, you know what I mean anyway, don't you? Yep, I know what you and mean. You, that is a yeah. very fair question. Yeah. Um, one of our problems is that through pretty much all of human history, that's all we have ever known. Yeah. So we don't have... Um, examples of all that sort of thing because that's all we've ever seen because Adam and Eve, they were the very first people and they sinned right at the beginning. Yeah, that's um, right. So we don't have any experience before that. That being said, there have been examples of lions, for example, who refuse to eat meat and just simply eat grass and the like. Uh, there have also been examples of deer who decide to attack other animals and eat, eat other animals and eat meat. Uh, so that sort of thing happens even now. Uh, there are also examples of animals, and unfortunately I can't think of any off the top of my head, um, but animals that have all of these features that we would associate with carnivores and which nevertheless are pure plant eaters. Uh, so we can't base purely just on appearances of how they go. Um, that sort of thing can be done, is done even now. I personally would love to be able to see what it was like way back then, but I don't think that mm. is quite possible. Can I just add to that point? Um, um, yeah, well done, Brian. Um, I, life is an ecosystem, and um, so one. So you've got. Let's. If you have a herd of deer that are, are ranging over the fields and consuming food. Mm and eating and there's nothing to kill them, then eventually they eat out all the, um, the food um, and not enough of them are dying uh, through natural causes to uh, bring that under control. So uh, that's one issue I have with the, the death mm. of animals before- Can okay, I answer that one before you go on, please? Yeah. Um, in that sort of scenario, we've got these animals, they've got no uh, predators, they're just there, they eat until everything's gone. Um, then there'll be lack of food, so they'll die off as a result of lack of food. The population will then die down again, uh, and then that will give the plants time to recuperate. The plants will build up, and then the animals will build up again. There can be a cycle that works that way and does happen a lot in nature yeah, anyway. But then sometimes it's catastrophic, like um, in Kangaroo Island where they got the koalas, where they pretty much literally nearly ate out all the eucalyptus trees. They were introduced to that area. It's an example of that actually it doesn't work. Um, 
And scripturally, when you mention Romans 5.12, where it says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. It doesn't yep. say all, all um, uh, creation. It says all right. people, right? Jesus only died for people who didn't die for dogs and cats. Death, it says, death came to all people. Yep. So, um, yeah, so I, I have that issue in the sense that it, I can't see it. Death came to all creation. It specifically says all people, yep. um, and yep. multiple um, versions will say the mm-hmm. same thing. Yeah, I've got no, yeah. no disagreement with that. It definitely does say that. But uh, yeah. Paul, in that particular context, was specifically talking about salvation through Jesus. And Jesus died for man. He did not die for the animals. The animals were a corollary to the original sin and therefore a corollary to uh, the salvation afterwards, as Paul implies in Romans 8. Mm. I think it's just hard to imagine uh, life that doesn't involve even the possibility of death. Yes, it's very hard because that's all we've ever known. Because like you said, if it's... If life uh, requires um, food, then food can run out. And um, uh, so, does that mean does that mean a world without accidents? Um, and I suppose uh, uh, that's where uh, yeah, all we've got to go on is Revelation, where it talks about no death and no tragedy of any sort. So. Um, I was interested at a uh, uh, one talk back in 2005, uh, the speaker said, um, uh, when we think about um, the world to come, we often think of uh, some kind of uh, existence in the clouds and not, not really physical, but... Everybody playing harps. Uh, but, but really it's, um, it's something that's physical and real but more real than we know and and he tried he, he painted a really attractive picture and and I suppose I've seen the same picture um reading a lot of yeah reading something that N.T. Wright wrote about about thinking about the uh the new creation as as kind of like a continuation of this one but different and better and when I realized when I when I read that I thought where have I where have I heard this kind of vibe before? And I thought, oh, that's that's the vibe. Uh, reading, reading sort of uh, young Earth um, description of, of what Earth was like um, before sin in the very short window of. of uh, so uh, I guess you have to, um, if we can't if we can't imagine uh, what it was then, then think about well what 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 does the Bible say about what it will be um, in the life to come? And then maybe try and project that idea uh, back. But it's, it's still hard to imagine um, any sort yeah, of life without death, particularly when, when we're saying that um, after the fall, life continued, but then it was like the life with death that we know now. Yep. One thing that may help for that is uh, C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, in particular the, um, the Magician's Nephew, which pictures the creation of that particular universe, and The Last Battle, which pictures the very end and the moving on into uh, uh, the new creation. And again, that's just a vague human picture, but it can help a little bit to understand how that could work. Uh, but the Bible also says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, yeah. no imagination is even be able to think up what God has got planned for us. Uh, so mm. God, God is so much bigger than we are. So yeah. if we talk about science, we kind of picture God as not really yeah. understanding science. He's just this old man in a long white gown and a long white beard uh, who has a big stick he can hit people with. But if this is the God who created the universe that we live in, then he understands the science of this universe completely. Mm. Um, this God is so much bigger and greater than we can possibly imagine. And so therefore what he can imagine is going to be pretty good. Mm. 
if there was no death, then um, you can't, can't really understand how there can be reproduction because uh, if, if nothing actually dies and they're multiplying, uh, eventually it's going to, uh, you're going to run out of space, aren't you, on the Earth? It'll stop multiplying at a suitable time. Yes. I have thought of that one. That kind of suggests that uh, God's original command to Adam and Eve and to the animals was to fill the Earth. So yeah. Kind of get the impression, and again, we can only make this up, we can only conjecture, uh, but that um, once they had filled the earth, they would have done what they were supposed to, and reproduction may have stopped. Uh, how and why that would have happened, I've got no idea. It never got to that point anyway. We also have eternity um, where we do live forever. And Jesus said that in the age to come, in eternity, we will not marry and be given in marriage. We will not have children. Um, we will be us. Mm. So that's not going to happen yeah, in that right. sense. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, Brian, I, I'm sorry about some of the background noise in my house. Um, uh, but um, um, you made the point fairly strongly uh, that if these things were not historical, then uh, all the foundation is lost. Yep. Uh, and But is that necessarily so? Um, can you actually um, have stories? that uh, uh, illustrate a principle and the principle is true, even though it's just a story and not a historical event. So I is mean, that, is that you, any, do you understand what I'm saying? That um, what so. does it necessarily follow that it has to be historical and not a story? <laughs> well, if you take Aesop's fables, um, which mm -hmm. I mentioned, you've got the story of the boy who cried wolf, there is no need whatsoever for that to be a true story. It conveyed a truth which the people then understood and which we understood today. Mm. Um, nothing hinged on that being a true story. Um, but the things in the Bible, they do hinge on it being a true story. I mentioned that Christianity is historically based. It's not based on philosophy. It's not based on stories. Um, Buddhism is based on the philosophy of Buddha. Um, there's no historical requirement for anything, um, simply for Hinduism or whatever. Um, Christianity is based on events. If those events did not happen, if Jesus did not come, if Jesus did not uh, die and was, Jesus was not raised, then Christianity is pointless. And Paul said that as well. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our faith depends on historicity. Mm. And also mentioned that Jesus and others considered and based their theology on the historicity of Genesis first few chapters. Mm. But, all right. but That's, that, is, uh, that is true in many cases, but yep. um, how can you show that is always true? Uh, can you give me an example where you think it might not be so I can... Well, all right. the, the example you gave from 1 Corinthians 15 is obvious. That um, yep. if Christ is not raised, then uh, yep. faith is futile, and it is absolutely dependent on a historical event. Um, but um, all right, but the the case is in point. You know, it could be yeah, some bits of Genesis one to eleven, uh, like things about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Like, was there a physical tree, or physical trees, uh, or these are just symbols? So, so. Um, I, I can't see how it necessarily follows that there had to be two literal trees, um, that they can still be symbolic uh, rather than... How would it help if actual... they were symbolic? Why, is, why would there be a problem if they were literal? Uh, there wouldn't be a problem if they were literal. I'm saying is it necessarily follows that there is a problem if they weren't? I think there is. Um, because it says that they ate a fruit, they saw that the fruit was good to eat. Uh, you may want to interpret it um, in some allegorical fashion, but then that's changing the entire hermeneutic. Uh, and there is no basis for changing that method of interpretation. Hmm. Another comment I, I made was um, like to actually hold the uh, young position and uh, literal wasn't a problem umpteen years ago. 
but now it is. Um, from the point of view that uh, the science has developed and um, um, all right, let's assume that a lot of the science, um, I'm, you probably won't want to assume it, <laughs> um, but um, the, a lot of the science, science is um, uh, valid and uh, we have the situation where um, we do um, kind of face a, a conflict between what was assumed in the past. Um, then it's kind of, a, we have to face a problem that wasn't faced by people in the past because there was no kind of um, counter voice, um, but now there is. And um, uh, so we inherit a problem that uh, uh, those before us weren't challenged by. <laughs> Uh, and so, so, and so we have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, like the uh, CMI position is to kind of uh, uh, um, attack the science. Um, no, they don't attack the science, they attack the interpretation. Yeah. They claim the evidence. My, 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 this, impression, right? my impression on it is they're not really interested in the science as such. They're like uh, people who kind of go into the sciences find it fascinating in its own right. And um, the impression I get is that um, they basically, it's a problem to them. So they have to kind of um, have an agenda when they interpret the science um, rather than actually being interested in the science itself. Yeah. Some people want to give the impression that science speaks with uh, a one voice, with a uniform voice, which is just not true. I agree. Um, and scientists, and no scientist is neutral, you know. Uh, we've all actually, there's, there's a, an intent with all this um, generally. It might not be with all scientists, but uh, there's an intent as to what's being pushed as well. Um, um, so I, I'm a bit, you know, I'm not... Uh, I do have a lot of regard for science, but it's, it doesn't speak with one voice at all. And, and they generally, a lot of scientists overreach. They really overreach what they think the science, um, what they know about science really tells. Uh, Can we uh, get back to the, um, the biblical sort of argument for this? Because this is what tonight's on about. Because um, mm -hmm. anyway, I, I wanted to... Um, just bring up something about um, Genesis 2 in the reference to being uh, uh, six literal days, 24-hour period. So that um, uh, it says that on the one day, okay, in Genesis 2, God created a host of creatures to live and flourish on the land. He created human beings. Um, uh, first Adam and then out of the ground, as then later on Eve. He planted a garden in the Eden. He caused trees and plants to grow in the Garden of Eden in accordance with the same ordinary providence he exercised over creation from the beginning. He placed Adam in the garden and appointed him as its keeper. He made a covenant, a covenant with Adam. Uh, he recognised that Adam was alone and noted that this was not a good idea um, and not a good state of affairs. He introduced Adam to animals and allowed him to, to name them. Um, and they reckon it's about at least two and a half thousand animals, um, put ma the man to sleep and made the woman Eve and out of part of Adam's side. And Adam's first reaction to his introduction to Eve was um, uh, wow. at long last. So I've, I'm, I have always been in conflict over these, and, and for a number of years, holding a young earth view, I'd always been in conflict over the, those two interpretations. I thought it's just this just does not make sense um, coming because I'm young, I've come from a young earth position. Um, so yeah. when so you nice bring in the word day and you, you yourself, um, Brian, said that it can have different literal meanings and we use it like the day of the dinosaurs, the day of the dinosaurs, meaning a period of time, without getting overreaching, right, any... I've got no problems with it being a lot, an extended period of time. And particularly when you say there are six, the Bible says evening and morning, evening and morning. Now, okay, yes, we consider evening as being uh, like the end of the day in the morning. But if you, at the very least, it could be 
beginning and ending. And then why not say on the seventh day there was a beginning uh, and an ending? Why, why, not, why does it stop on the sixth and say there was an evening and a morning? There's evening and morning, evening and morning, evening and morning for six days, but on the seventh day there's not. And then in Hebrews it goes on to say that we are yeah. in the seventh day. So I, I'm without overreaching. I, while I appreciate where you're coming from, and I know that you can interpret this Genesis this way, I can appreciate that. You can still interpret it fr from a, from a day age view without any problems. So. Yeah, well, Brom Bromley mentioned a number of points, but I think the first one, the point that she made was that's a lot to pack in one day. That's basically what you're saying, wasn't it, Bromley? Yeah, it is. Two and a half thousand animals. And when you name an animal, you don't go uh, in five seconds and name it. You study it, you know, and that's what Adam did, you know. So, I, I just, it's, yeah, I, it's, to me, it's the easiest way to say that the, the, the scriptures speak. They don't contradict themselves then, you know, if you give um, them a long period of time. Well, the number of animals is questionable, though I agree that it's still a lot of animals. Um, it's also, it doesn't say that it's just all in the one day that those animals came on. It could have been over a few days. No, it says on the sixth day he created all the animals, uh, the land animals. The yeah, sea animals. Land animals on the sixth day, but that was not necessarily... Um, the garden could have been later. Created everything on the sixth day, seventh day rested, and then just uh, put in this garden on the seventh day, Adam in in there, and this is all in the next week. But then Eve comes. Eve comes after naming the animals. Yep. And and yeah. and Genesis right. one, Eve's yep. yeah, male That's and female, right. he created them on the sixth day. I have heard this explained. I cannot remember right now. Um, mm. I'm also not quite sure where you got from Hebrews you mentioned that said that we're still in the seventh day. I've never seen that. There's one. Some, it might not be Hebrews, but there's some reference I've got in my back of my head. Where, no, it doesn't where say seventh day. It doesn't say seventh day. It says there remaineth a rest for the people of God. So it's yeah. linking it with the Sabbath rest, but it yeah. doesn't actually use in that passage the word seventh day. Yeah, but, but that rest should be in the consideration of not just for the one day, it's yes, meaning a spiritual yeah. rest, isn't it? So that we can yeah, enter awesome. the rest, yeah. If we um, enter it and it remains for people rest. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I um, think that's... Yeah. Uh, Jesus said, my father is working and so I'm working too. So in a sense, God's work continues. Either, the even spiritual though... work. Yeah, spiritual work though. So, Not uh, physical uh, work. He hasn't created anything new. How do you know? Uh, but Jesus healed, didn't he? Jesus healed. He said, well, my father's working. Yeah, uh, that's... Yeah, working that work. yeah, he said he hasn't stopped. Yeah. 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 Um, I think there's at least one passage in the Bible in the Old Testament where it uses that word, uh, the Hebrew word yom, day, mm. in the sense, I think it says, in the day that God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Yeah. yeah. There's at least one passage that says that. So it's using that word, that same Hebrew word, in that broader yeah. sense of uh, the, what was the six days back in Genesis 1. Mm. Um, yeah, the context makes that clear, though, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I suppose you well, could say to that. Well, to me, that makes it sound like it's a long period of time, so that you can take it as a long period of time. Yeah. Uh, exactly. More than without complicating it. Again, so. what was long in that context? So Whoa, the day yeah. the Lord God created, six days. But, but God, to God, uh, a day is a, is a thousand years is... Uh, isn't that what the scripture that says? A thousand yeah. years a day to God. A thousand years as a day. Yeah. So, I mean, to God, we're, this is just far a moment, isn't it? Really. That's what right. we're thinking. Right. Yeah. That was one of my points. So why was it seven days? Why not seven million years or no time at all? God could have been yeah. in no time flat. So he could have been seven yeah. days. Uh, he didn't need seven days. He didn't need seven billion years. He could have yeah. done it just bang. Um, but he specifically chose seven days for a reason. And that reason is to establish something important, which was, again, the Sabbath and the seven-day week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Genesis 1 is definitely describing seven days because you've got that pattern, you know, the evening, you know, the Hebrew day begins at sunset 
the, the new day begins at sunset and goes through to sunset of the following day. They're different from how we view days uh, from midnight to midnight. Um, but it's definitely describing seven days, but um, it's still, um, you know, the issue is, well, what is, why, what is the seven days? What does it mean? Hey, can I just canvas one other thing? Uh, it's been said that uh, Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 are actually separate. There's a, there's a gap there between that and the rest of day one. The day one, God says, let there be light, and there was light. God saw it was good, and then, and then that was the first day. So Genesis 1 and 2, uh, the initial creation of the heavens and the earth itself uh, and the chaos that was there on the earth's surface, at least, uh, uh, was actually before the first day. What, what do you think of that? Uh, that is a, one of the theories that's been made up to... Um, of trying to fit in long ages for the creation of the world. So that has all sorts of things being done. And normally at that point, it envisages a full creation, which then got destroyed. And then God started again uh, to create what we have today. Um, oh, okay. creation. Yeah. So that is kind of the gap theory is kind of how it goes. Um, so along with that, the theory is that there is a word became uh, missing from our text. The earth became... Um, Empty and void. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, it doesn't have to mean that, does it? But it did, you know, uh, there, there could still be a gap um, between verses one and two and then the rest, you know, that, that's not actually part of day one? Not really. <coughs> okay. Excuse me. All right. Again, God, it's clear for day one, day two, day three. If you have a gap in the middle, then it kind of, again, destroys the effect. It, it, it seems reasonably clear that there was activity prior to the first day. Uh, well, yes. the, the, first day. The, 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 the issue is whether verses one and two are part of that day one, because what did, when did it mention day one? In about verse seven, didn't it? Uh, it definitely covers the light, the creation of light, the separation of light from darkness, God seeing that it was good. That's all. That's definitely part of day one. The question is, do verses one and two fit into that day one or were they prior to it and it doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that there was a um, a creation that was destroyed and then god recreated that that that's another that there's another um a matter of uh, discussion too mm. Mm. Uh, one of the uh sorry one of the explanations of that first bit is that there is almost like uh, cosmic soup uh, operating and it says the spirit of God is moving over the surface of the waters, implying that God is working a blueprint into elements that are hovering there as sort of cosmic soup. And then out of that, you get the process of the seven day. So it's not chaos. It's a condition that God has already got there. That's mm. the starting point of his spirit to... Uh, work the plan into into being well That's it does imply a kind of a bit of a chaos because it says uh, isn't aren't the great hebrew words tohu and bohu uh, the earth was without form and void it says yeah, yeah that's right the but the the i'm struggling for the right cosmic word but if you can see that there's a fluid existing before that the holy spirit is programming and working mm -hmm. Uh, upon it's bringing intelligence and design into the cosmic soup and then you get the the separation of the light and then the, all the stuff that comes following so uh, there is a an explanation uh, based on the fact that it's the spirit of god that's working the whole process from the beginning in a very set yeah. order and it's very scientific order it's all complementary yeah. and work at the conclusion. I do have another comment while I get the opportunity, if that's okay, Kevin, sure. to respond to Bronwyn's comment. And that is, there is a, a difference between the day that Adam is created and the events afterwards. And what, what we need to see is it's actually Christ that's bringing together the elements to form the, the body of Adam 
And so all the chemicals that make up his body are found in the earth today. And he's like the master sculptor, bringing it into a physical body. Then it says he breathed on it to make him a living soul. And I believe it's Adam and Eve's spirit that is formed on that particular day. But Eve is not uh, brought out of the body at that point. It's only Adam walking around uh, on, that, on that day. Then later on, Christ plants the Garden of Eden as a special place, takes Adam, Adam from his created place and puts him into that dimension. And then out of that dimension, Eve's spirit is drawn out of his body and uh, meshed with it with the whole analogy of the bone uh, aspect. So there's two separate processes. So men and women are created spiritually on the same day, but the separation is there in their body form in the story of Adam, different to that of Eve. But it was still on the sixth day, though. Adam and Eve were created no, on the sixth day. No, no. If, if you can use the analogy, there's the uh, humans are made up of a body and a yeah. spirit, a living soul. The two yeah, come together. Yeah. What I'm saying is on the day that Adam's created, Eve is also spiritually created. Her soul is mm -hmm. created on the day, but she doesn't have a body, physical. That has to be drawn out later in the Garden of Eden. So no, she... I don't see that. Like, I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but there's to me, it's all on the, that, that um, humans were made on the sixth day. Yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. spiritually, yeah. but the body form is different. Now, but people you can't think... have them on the seventh day because that means um, God's not resting. Uh, no, I'm saying that Eve's spiritually created on the sixth day, but her body is later down the track in the Garden of Eden. No, but it can't. <laughs> the body and the spirit come together. Okay. You know, it's I that's why it's a catch amongst the pigeons. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, the, the order, it's the order of creation that man comes first with his body. I've got no problems with that. But I'm just saying, to me, I've I've never heard anyone say that Eve was not made on the on the sixth day. You're saying no. that God rested, she, and then his for her physical body was made on the on week two. No, no well, some some period later, uh, the two come together. See, the important thing for us to see is the real us is the spiritual dimension. Our bodies are only containers. I com I completely agree with you, but. I still can't see God creating after the seventh day. After he rested on the seventh day, he doesn't create at all. He only does spiritual work. And the sixth point. day, so it, was, it was very good after the sixth day. So yeah. I would suggest that the, the whole work of bodily creation of humans had been done by then. Physical and, yeah. But, um, yeah. Hmm. Just to uh, stress um, uh, Bronwyn's earlier point, um, in verse 11, uh, it says, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruits bearing uh, fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is seed, according to its kind uh, on the earth. And it was so. So God says, Let, so God doesn't actually kind of do it. <laughs> he says, Let the uh, um, earth sprout vegetation and plants. And so, yeah. yeah, and so they're basically uh, he's uh, declaring uh, an edict or a command or a cause or whatever it is and sets a process going. So that process, uh, whether the um, um, plants yield seed and the fruit bears, uh, trees bear fruit, and um, so it goes on. And so, so that process would seem not to be encapsulated in a 24-hour day. Don't follow that at all, sorry. Does anybody follow what I'm saying? Because it's, it's good. God's kind of kicking off a process, and that process mm -hmm. of stuff reproducing and sprouting and all that sort of thing, that doesn't happen in a day. <laughs> no, that's right, yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, I think that, that that principle is uh, repeated several times. Uh, let's see. Um, Sorry? He's saying that God can't produce fully formed plants. I, um, no doubt he can't, but he, he basically says let them kind of reproduce and uh, kick yeah. off the process. And the, the process obviously wouldn't occur in a single 24-hour day. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? You're saying the egg came first. Well, uh, with uh, God's declaration. Um, um, uh, probably occurred at a specific point in time. But then he says kicks off a process. And that process of the re reproduction of plants, etc., would does not occur in a day. <laughs> but but has... Yeah, no, very interesting. Yeah. The feeling that God uh, commanded the Adam and Eve, or the man and the woman and the uh, animals to multiply and fill the earth, that was not expected to happen in a day. Hmm. That was in that case, that. no, in, in that case, uh, um, uh, uh, without comment on it, um, uh, so, but look at verse 11 on, uh, uh, it says, and God said, let the earth uh, sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which there is seed according to its uh, kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation. Plants yielding yeah. seed according to their own kinds and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then the comment in verse 13, and then it was evening and there was morning the third day. But um, so, but verses 11 and 12 uh, describe a process which would have took taken a long time. And then it's covered by, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. But it obviously wasn't a 24-hour day. Are you suggesting that the plants were in the earth? They weren't just floating in the air, they were in the earth. That, well, okay. presumably, God, presumably God created Adam uh, fully formed as, a, as an adult male, or an adult, I shouldn't say male, uh, as an adult human. Yeah. Um, in some way, he was male and female, uh, I think, but uh, initially, but he did create, it seems he created Adam as a full... Um, adult um, so god could have planted a garden in eden he could have made a garden in eden instantly couldn't he and from there on then everything reproduces you know the, the seeds grow the fruit the fruit and the seed and it germinates and all this sort of thing but he could have planted a garden instantly um, that he put adam in to, to look after it um so interesting um, um why would Adam say at long last if he'd been waiting? I know men can be pretty impatient. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's an uh, English interpretation. <laughs> yeah, but at long last, and there's lots of different uh, um, different um, Bibles will say the same thing. So it's not a 24 hour period if you're going to say at long last. You know. Even yeah, if you have one and a half thousand animals in one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd think it'd take some time for him to feel his loneliness. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah, wasn't, yeah. there wasn't a woman there to know that he was lonely. Uh, you know, it was only how, as he experienced all these animals and what they were, well, you know, you could milk a cow and you could, uh, uh, a dog would and, respond. And also get over and, the excitement. When you're in, excite, in, in an exciting time, which he would have yeah. been, you know, that takes a while for that to actually recede and then go, oh, actually, I'm lonely. You know, that's more than that's what you, you'd expect that to take very quite a long time, you know, especially yeah. when he's very happy with all the animals that he's encountering. And wow, look at this and look at that. At least and, a month, at least a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been looking at this up since you've been talking about it. And in this verse, it says, The man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This yeah. one will be called cool woman because she was yeah. taken from man. Uh, so it's, it's a slightly different nuance on it. And you kind of get the impression that God has been bringing these animals to him uh, in pairs. And he sees, oh, there's a pair of zebras, there's a pair of dogs, there's a pair of uh, mastodons, there's a pair of whatever. Uh, but there's only me. Something missing here. And then the last, oh, this one's like me. End of the line. A very long day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I think you would have it's been very long time ago. <laughs> The world was very different. Yeah.
Can I just mention one other thing on a, another subject, talking about how long ago all this was. Uh, there was a famous uh, bishop, presumably in the Anglican Church, Bishop Usher, who added up all the, um, the ages recorded in the Bible and came up with the date of 4004 BC. That that's when God must have created, I think he said it was nine o'clock in the morning or something like that, that that's when it actually happened, the creation of Adam. But he did work out it was 4004 BC. Uh, there's a bit of a problem with that because... Um, there's, there is some uncertainty about the actual text. Um, some of the very ancient versions are slightly different. And I believe one of the critical things is that I think there's a Septuagint. I'm just going off the top of my head here, but the Septuagint version, which seems to be the one that was used in Jesus' day and the, and the time of the New Testament church and the everything. That they, in the New Testament. Say again? It's the one that was quoted in the New Testament. That's right. Yeah, it seems to be well, the one. The that... Jews, you know, we can't be quite so sure, given that he would have spoken Aramaic most of the time. Uh, so they they could have had a Hebrew Bible that he would have used. Right. Um, but when the writers of the New Testament wrote, they quoted from the uh, Septuagint. Okay. Well, I, I believe there's at least a generation difference uh, between <laughs> some of the ancient versions and now. We can't know which was the original. I think there's a, uh, a Canaan, C A I N A N, in the yep. line uh, that's in one version. And not in the other, and also there's a there's a fluidity with as we know uh, with the terms um, father and son and begat. So although these could very and I believe they were historical characters, uh, Adam and then Seth and then oh, I can't remember all the names. You know Methuselah and Noah and so on. Um, that that they it might not be literally father and son. It could it says there were so many years. And then Adam became, or well, one of them, uh, X became the father of Y. It could mean the progenitor of, he could have begat somebody who begat, who begat, who begat in, in somebody else. Just in the same way, we'd say Jesus is the son of Abraham. He's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. There, there, could be, there could be generations missing there, even though they are actually historical characters. Yeah. Yeah, there is some of that in there, and we can see certain points where that does follow. And the example that you used of Jesus is referred to a number of times in the Gospels as the son of David, and that does flow through. Um, but the, reading through the Bible as it is, you get the very strongly get the impression that by default it is one after the other, even though there could yeah. be exceptions. But even if you do allow for lots of exceptions, a lot more than makes any sense whatsoever and a lot more gaps than makes any sense whatsoever, mm. it still does not give billions of years or... Oh, I agree with that. Like that. Yeah, but so it, it might be a bit more than 6,000. at most. So yeah, but yeah. If you, no one, no uh, old age uh, creationist would say billions of years of humans. They would, they, at the yeah, maximum, yeah. you're talking hundreds of thousands, 100,000, 120, yeah. 130, yeah. and yeah. then somewhere between, I don't know, 40,000 and then, but you know, it's not billions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a fair point. But um, if, like I was saying, even if you do allow for gaps, like Jeff was saying, yeah. it does not get you anywhere near enough time to allow for any of that. Yeah. Also, in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter one, there are a couple of uh, generations missing there. And it seems that there there's that seem to be some stylistic element with this. Uh, even though I believe it is all history, those are the real characters and everything, yep. um, Matthew 1. Um, but there's he wants to say there's 14 generations between yep. Abraham and David. There's 14 generations from David to the exile, and then there's 14 generations from there to the Christ. And a similar way, back in Genesis, when you read the genealogies there, there are actually 10, there are 10 genealogies sorry, 10 generations between Adam and Noah, and there's 10 generations between Noah and Abraham. Now, um, you know, the Bible doesn't make any comment about that, but you think that it sort of feels stylized somehow, you know? Well, yeah, maybe, but at the same time, if you're going to picture lots of generations, you can always pick a couple of points and have a certain number of generations. So I don't think you can read too much into that, um, the bit in Matthew, where it's 14 generations of 14 generations, clearly Matthew is trying to be stylized. And Matthew was specifically writing for a Jewish audience and relating yeah. everything as it was. And so he was doing it in the way that appealed to them and mm. bringing it in that way worked. And again, his audience would have known about the missing gaps and understood that those... That's true too. Yeah. Yeah. 
But yeah, Steve, it's it's like, to me, oh, sorry. To me, Steve, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, let's look at the rate of uh, population growth. Now, I brought it up a few years ago again, but another thing, they studied, uh, uh, anthropologists studied a remote tribe in the Amazon, divorced either from birth control pills and or modern medication. So the, if you like, the birth side of things and the, um, the mortality side of things were, well, roughly what it would have been up to we started to get the pill in about 1960 and we got lots of medicines. It was at a rate they grew, and it might have been about a decade they measured it, and it grew at an annual rate of about 0.5%. If you look at the Jewish population, remember the Jews have a very good catalogue of all their ancestors. They have to. It, it links them back to Abraham. They come at about 0.3% annual growth. A very simple bit of compounding backwards and you can easily get to about six reproductive couples 4,300 years ago with flood. Basic mathematics. Just look at it right now. I do appreciate it. the centuries had the Black Death, all sorts of plagues, uh, probably some very productive times of growth uh, when the crops were good. But on average, that is the rate of human um, population growth. And a very simple, Backwards going, you're going to get to around about six couples about 4,300 years ago. Uh, so, so can you so you're saying what, how many children or how long is the year? I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost. Yeah, okay, 0.3% population growth. For a, for, a, for, a, for a population, it grows, and you know, you, you can choose it. And it started with a, a study of an Amazon tribe, yeah. isolated from outside interference. About point, actually, there was about 0.5%. The Jews oh, yeah. was about 3%, and let's face it, they've had some pretty catastrophic things happen to them. Um, probably from what well, we know, Augusta, you know Augustus said, let's, let's have a census, and we read about that, um, whether it was Quirinius or whoever. But the fact is we do have some, some markers that give reasonable approximate um, uh, population measures. Uh, in the case of the Jews, I think I've got to be correct in saying it was before the Holocaust. They measured, they knew the population, Jewish population fairly well just before the Holocaust. And obviously that was a big, but if you go from then back to, you know, around about Quirinius and his um, uh, census, uh, you come up, with around about 0.3 percent, that allows for all the Black Death and all the other horrible things that happened, as well as, in fact, uh, the uh, great uh, the Jewish wars that the Romans persecuted. So about 0.3 percent, and a very quick population. What are we? Eight billion people today. If you do a quick uh, a reverse um, uh, growth, you'll come out there or thereabouts. Certainly in around about 4,000 years. Yeah, you know, give or take a bit, uh, but it's it's certainly about 4,300 years ago. Yeah, you could have had six uh, couples. Moses and sorry, Noah and Mrs. Noah, I think, had uh, passed their fertility date. Uh, so you just got to lay out for Sham, him, and Japheth and, and their Mrs. to carry on the human population. Yeah, th there's no great problem with uh, the numbers increasing um, from you know just six thousand years ago. I don't see any difficulty there. No. You know, only tonight, only today, Madri and I watched a program on TV. Uh, it was about uh, uh, Israel, and they were dealing with the uh, Orthodox Jews in Israel, <laughs> and they're having, they're typically having twelve kids, things like that. So the the numbers are growing incredibly. They get married young, they have yeah. huge families, and they feel it's their God-given duty <laughs> to do this. It's okay for Jacob. It's okay for them. Pardon? If it's okay for Jacob, it was okay for them. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but they're, they're talking about how the demographics are changing in Israel and uh, the the Orthodox, the the strict Haredi, Haredi they call them, uh, are just growing very rapidly. Anyway. Yeah, I you think know, said, they yeah. To re reproduce and multiply and fill the earth. So, and, uh, you know, it was not long after the Garden of Eden, was it? So. Mm. Presumably, on conditions the, uh, are very good. On uh, the uh, yeah, the Bishop Usher uh, chronology, um, did anyone do something similar uh, in much earlier, like any um, Jewish commentaries on the Old Testament or or early Christian ones that did the same thing, adding up the years to 
to get any sort of date. Mm -hmm. I think we should end this one Stephen. He's mentioned a couple of times on that one. Yeah, yeah, they have to try it. Yes, there is. Um, oh, I've got it. In fact, it's actually in uh, uh, Archbishop, someone who's done a, a uh, an updated version of Archbishop Usher had this um, annexes down the back. And one of them, they do quote, why is the difference between the Jews? Who, you may remember I showed the Jerusalem Post. I think we're at about, or oh, what are we at? About uh, 5,700 or whatever it was. So there is about a few hundred years difference between what Archbishop Usher would have calculated as um, age of the universe and what the Jews do. And uh, there is some difference, but the guy who did it came immediately after Shimon Barkova, who the Jews themselves say that was the Mashiach. And it was a, he uh, revolted against um, Hadrian's forces in <coughs> AD 135. And the guy that then tried to calculate the earth wanted to make sure that Daniel's prophecies pointed to this other guy, Shimon Bar Koba, as okay. the guy that would be uh, the you know, Daniel chapter 9's pointing the whatever it was, the 77s or 69 seven. So that's apparently how they arrive at theirs. But, yes, he was a quite uh, well-credentialed um, rabbi at about uh, probably 145, maybe 150 AD. Steve, yeah, there, are uh, other, there are other difficulties. There are other difficulties in calculating this number too, because when you look back in the reigns of the kings and things like that, and they give a certain number of years for this king and then the next king and so on, um, there were some co-regencies, and so yeah. they wonder, well, how does it? But yes. Yeah, you know, there again, different ways of interpreting that are only going to make a few decades difference. It's not going to make a thousand years difference. It's just a not much. And the other thing, of course, we only have a precision in the genealogies to one year. So if someone was born one day after that one year, the next yeah. guy was married one day into the new year, you've immediately got a, a one year uh, yeah, precision. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you'd only be arguing yeah. over small numbers. But like, you, right. you're, yeah, Steve, your argument about a kind of role in the growth rate back is um, uh, an interesting uh, argument. Um, because it, yeah, because the maths would seem to point that way. Uh, but uh, when um, uh, Hugh Ross spoke, he uh, one of the things he uh, mentioned was that in the past ten thousand years, there's been a, um, a period of um, a meteorological stability, which is um, associated with the uh, rapid growth in civilization over the last ten thousand years or so. And um, prior to that, the, um, the uh, climate was highly variable in terms of temperature. And so it did not suit human flourishing. And so, okay. yeah. And so well, that, um, that could be one. So yours is a uniform formatarian argument. <laughs> and no, no, it takes in the flows. Yep. It takes in the, you know, this, I'm talking about, well, yeah. first of all, the Amazon tribe, you're right, it was uniform, we're only talking about a decade or two, I, I can't deny that. But turn, certainly the Jewish people, you know, the, you know, the Jewish wars, I think it was something, almost a million Jews were slaughtered during Titus's conquest of Jerusalem. Anyway, the, a big number, uh, as well as the Black Death and all the other things. The Fate of Rome, a very good book to read. Uh, it, it describes why the Roman Empire, it was only produced by, he was a professor, it was published by Prince, Princeton, Princeton University, I think, um, and is a historian's view, but combining both uh, the, the great plagues that happened towards the end there, how Rome really went up. There was actually quite a warm period. The monsoons actually got into the Mediterranean and Rome was very well watered, great crops. And he points out that that's why Rome expanded. But then there was a cold uh, change around about four or 500 that's when the bubonic plague certainly swept through Rome. And they've actually got historical reports of how once thriving towns were down to just small villages, how quickly civilization collapsed around about 400. So what uh, has happened in the past? Sure, but it happened in the time frame that I'm talking about as well. Black Death wiped out, what, a third of Europe, I think, didn't it? Mm. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, certainly parts of Western Europe. I think Poland... Uh, where the population was less dense, managed to escape the full-on effects uh, that you got in the cities. But certainly we've had great calamities um, 
you know, in the last few thousand years. Yeah, but but if um, if you kind of follow through, uh, it'll be interesting that, uh, when Hugh Ross comes on, we can actually question him on this. Yeah. Um, but um, um, if he was saying there was kind of a distinct um, change in weather patterns um, uh, so that we've only, in the last few thousand years, we've had relatively stable temperatures. And is it's it the prior sun. to... It's the, sun. it's the sun stability, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah, well, uh, the, yeah. Again, um, look, uh, one of the young Earth people is a, a distinguished meteorologist from the... Um, uh, from used to be the US Meteorology Bureau, and he points that the uh, ice age in all probability happened immediately after the flood. The point being that the the most uh, the driest climate at the moment is what Antarctica. Unless you have warm water, you won't get precipitation. And so people say, "Oh, the Earth's cool." Well, I'm sorry, you're not going to get an ice age because the ice will not be produced because the water's too cool. So it had to be something resulting from a massive, well, a warming of the water, the great upthrust or whatever, and I'm not going to go to why, but it's not the conditions we see today. It would not be due to the uh, sun cooling down because you wouldn't get enough um, water uh, evaporation to cause the ice to come onto the earth. You had mm. to have a combination of warm oceans and cool air, possibly a great uh, cloud covering or something that caused the absence of solar radiation to warm the atmosphere and so earth was cool but there was warm water that caused all the precipitation that caused the ice and this is a guy this is a guy who's a meteorologist um as i say distinguished worked with the u.s meteorological Bureau. well i can't answer the details because i don't know <laughs> yeah uh, uh, beginning what hugh ross was suggesting while i don't personally agree with him if we assume for the sake of argument that he is right that's ten thousand years and working on the numbers that um, Steve has just been giving us, that's way too long for the um, relatively small amount of population we have in the world. So right you say it has to be 6,000 years. 6,000 years at that rate, we'd be having uh, 20, 30 billion at least on the planet. Yeah. Uh, and if I may say not just 6,000, I'm actually going back to the flood. Remember, there was a big truncation. And I think those who are biologists say there, there was a big, uh, what they call a choke point, when they look at the DNA, how the DNA is not that variable. It, I mean, it is, it should, it, if it was much older, you'd expect to see a much greater spread of them. So they point to, I think, what they call a choke point at some point in history not that long ago where mm. there was a relatively few humans that then spread out. Uh, there may have been some calamity, like the great extinction event from that um, meteor in the Gulf of Mexico, but some extinction event that throttled back the number of humans so that the variation in genes that we see at the moment do go back not long ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet, yeah, I accept, accept your argument that if you uh, apply current po population uh, growth rates and argue them backwards, you only get a, a few thousand years. So to, uh, if, if uh, that is not the case, then there must have been a long periods of time when there was not much growth in human population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if we've got the uh, wonderful um, conditions for 10,000 years, then that's more relevant. Uh, just to kind of, uh, yeah, I've made, made the point about uh, versus uh, 11 to 13, which seem to imply uh, a longer period than a day. Well, that's that's where I, how it appeared to me. Um, and we, the, the patterns also in uh, uh, apparent in I think it's verse twenty onwards. It says, "And God said, let uh, where did it say let dry land appear?" Really. Uh, the, the waters. Uh, that's the second day, isn't it? Oh yeah, that's verse oh, no. nine. Yeah, verse nine. Let God and then and God said, "Let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place. Let dry land appear." And it was, yeah. yeah. So is that a, um, a single day event? <laughs> why not? God is God, why not? As I said before, he could have done everything in no time flat or seven milliseconds or whatever. So yeah. 
Mm. He's perfectly capable of doing it in a day if that's what he wants to do. Well, that's it, yeah. The, the, the other possibility is that's a, a divine, uh, defining, uh, initiating a process that occurred over a period of time. So it's open to interpretation at that point. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the uh, views pushed by uh, Hugh Ross is that these uh, may, which is uh, what's uh, progressive creation? Uh, day age creation. No, it, 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 I, his, uh, it, it, there's a particular term for his view, which is uh, progressive creation. Is saying, oh. saying that, uh, all right, God acts at distinct points in time and initiates yeah. a new phase. And yeah. you could almost consider it as though, all right, these were distinct points in times, which you could refer to as a day, but they're yeah. not necessarily consecutive days. They're actually separated in time by a huge period of time where God actually initiates a process and says, let, and then uh, kicks off a process and that process goes for a while. And then God can intervenes later and with another let. And um, then uh, at a distinct, so he initiates phases of development which are separated in time by uh, huge amounts of time. You can say that without looking closely at the text, but if you're going to talk about the first day, the second day, the third day, it implies they're consecutive days. And I, I'd say I, that's and, the obvious meaning of the text, yeah. Yeah, and I quoted those other two guys who are old earth creationists, not young earth creationists, and they are convinced that the text wants it to be uh, seven literal consecutive days. Whether that's what happened or not is another matter entirely, but they believe that that is what the author, original author intended to convey. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens when um, Hugh Ross um, appears, uh, because I presume he's actually going to um, explain that point of view and so you can question him on that. Yeah. One of the points uh, about this time question is uh, we see in science the idea of a compressed signal Many years ago, when someone explained the whole stuff with the internet and telecommunications, I said, how does it work? And he said, very simple, all the information is compressed down and is able to be sent in a much shorter phase. So if we see what God's doing in those six days of creation, is he's actually doing compressed information giving uh, over the 24 hour period, but we would measure the outcome as a long period. So if you use the analogy made earlier, I think you said it, Jeff, about Adam, he makes Adam on a day, but if you sent Gordon and a team of medical experts to that day with all their equipment, they would measure him and say, hang on, here's a guy a certain size who can speak he can think, he can do stuff. This guy is more than 24 hours years old. He's 40 plus or whatever the criteria would be. What I'm saying is both are correct. The God perspective is how it's done by him because of his spirit and he's in control. But what humans do is go back and we analyze everything and you cannot get a human being made in 24 hours with the technology we have today. But you can analyze a man and say he's 40 years old. You know, yeah, but I actually, I'm going to, two... yes, sorry. Yep, go I, on. I, I, would go, I would say that if you looked at Adam, right, like I'm 54 and I've got a few oh. sunspots, right, and a yep. few wrinkles. Oh, gee, um, you have me full. <laughs> 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 and a few grey hairs, I might say. They're getting a few more. Um, I would say that he wouldn't have had any grey hairs. He Correct. wouldn't have had any wrinkles. Correct. No yeah. skin, no sunspots. Yeah. I reckon he would have actually looked young, even though he yeah, was, I, 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 he had he, maturity, he looked, maturity. Yeah. So no, he he's looked like a baby. Yeah. He's perfect. Soft, he's not, skin. <laughs> yeah. No, you are correct. There's no age at work, no yeah. death at work. So yeah. the medical team examining him would 
see him as a fantastic specimen of humanity, no question. So they would have trouble coming up with age. The point I'm making, he's not a one-day-old baby with no intelligence and no ability to talk. He's created with a whole lot of faculties which operated from day one. And that's the important thing to see with Adam and Eve. From day one, they are fully human, but no death, no grey hairs, no whatever. Yeah. And we would yes, have to well. I assume that that medical team went there during the period while Adam was asleep, ran about when God took the rib out. Because yeah. Adam didn't know anything about it. Yeah. Um, the rib actually is one of the rare bones that can do something, according to the doctors. It's a special reason why the rib was used and not some other part of the anatomy. Yeah, and the thing, it doesn't literally, it doesn't have to mean rib, does it? Mm. The, uh, uh, but the rib's got an unusual property medically. I'm not sure, but there is some property mm. with it. I'm not sure if it can grow again or something. There's something in the rib that is quite unique. Okay, I've just opened my Bible here. It says in verse chapter 2, verse 22, the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. This is the uh, New International Version. But there's yeah. a marginal note to say, uh, or part, rib or part. So I don't know what the Hebrew is there, but uh, um, I don't think it has to mean rib as we understand it. No, tissue of some sort, yeah. Be that as it may, it's interesting that a man has an X and a Y chromosome. The woman has two X. Mm. Uh, so a woman could come from man, but man could not come from woman in that sense, uh, physically. And so the fact that it says taken from a rib, it's taken from the body of the man. And with just a straight rib, how we want to interpret that one, I'm not entirely certain myself. I wasn't there either. I missed that medical team. Um, I, was going, I was going to ask, and why not? <laughs> we, can, we can speculate a lot about these things, um, can't we? So it appears that when God took that rib or whatever out of Adam, he took just the X chromosomes. Which is interesting. Yeah. Oh. All right. I suppose All what right. I'm wondering is um, what's, what's the alternative? Um, uh, Brian, you've you've presented really well and explained things as clearly as anyone we've had on here. Um, but if if instead um, uh, we don't have a literal early Genesis, um, it's not strictly historical, uh, and instead we have uh, old Earth. Um, uh, according to the majority scientific view, what's the best way to make sense of um, how we got uh, early Genesis as we have mm. um, from a Christian perspective um, that that still has that as, as Genesis as God breathed, however we're going to understand that. And how would we explain Jesus' uh, perception that it was... Uh... A historical narrative and true story. Yeah, How would we explain the uh, bits in the New Testament that are built on first chapters of Genesis. Yeah. All right. Well, answer, answer the question then, uh, Brian. What would we do? Well, Brian doesn't have to answer that because he's because he's explained um, how how uh, how the text uh, points to a young Earth, and so um, and so. Yeah, so he doesn't have to answer the question. So it's, I guess it's it's any of us who who think that um, uh, that that an older is more persuasive. We need to we need to answer the question of uh, uh, how yeah, give, given that the uh, the writer seems to want to uh, talk about it as young. So does that mean? Uh, that's a uh, legend that has has become part of the Old Testament, and so how do we, um, uh, yeah, how do how do we read that now? I, well, that that, 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 is one, that is one that is one track that, that is taken. Uh, uh, some groups will uh, say um, kind of weaken the uh, um, 
um, truthfulness of the Genesis account and say, look, it was all written within the uh, cosmology at the time. And so uh, we're putting a, a, a monotheistic framework around it. And so uh, they'd say it is not historical. That is one track that is taken. And uh, probably uh, biologists would uh, form it, fall into that category. Yeah. Uh, but uh, peop uh, like people like um, William Lane Craig, uh, John Lennox, or Hugh Ross uh, maintain a high view of scripture without weakening it. Um, but um, uh, and just look at what the text says and try to explain it on those terms with, while maintaining a high view. But other groups will take that uh, track and say, no, it, it's just not historical. It's just grabbing what was around at the time and then putting a, a theological spin on it. Again, yeah, the points I brought up about death, about salvation, about uh, the problem of pain, all that sort of thing, uh, with, mm. then ending up with Richard Dawkins' quote there. And if you do go along that path, then I would consider Richard Dawkins' point to be very valid. Well, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I'm not sure it's actually applicable uh, because um, uh, what he's saying is the text obviously says single day. And um, if you don't believe that, you're barking mad. Um, well, but, but, but the people are symbolic and there was a symbolic sin, a lot of real sin. Um, then what's the point of Jesus? He died for a symbolic sin uh, committed by a symbolic person, uh, neither mm. of which actually existed or happened. Uh, so what's the whole point? Yeah, well, I'm just saying that uh, other, other groups will actually go down the path and say um, uh, the writers at the time had, were in no position to know modern science, and so they grabbed what they had around that day and then put a monotheistic spin on it. As the explanation of the text. The Sorry? We don't have science a thousand years into the future, so we could be spouting nonsense too if you're going to put it that way. Oh, yeah, sure. But, but I'm just saying that there's some groups who take that track. Mm. Mm. So there has to be uh, there has to be an explanation that covers all the truth. You're looking for a toe, are you? A theory of Sorry, everything. you're looking for a toe, a theory of everything. Yeah, yeah. They, well, it must exist because uh, the, we have the reality. We have uh, Genesis 11, uh, one, and we know what it says, and we also have uh, the facts of the world. Uh, so we're uh, in the position where we both have to interpret the text and interpret the world. Um, so our interpretation could be wrong, <laughs> but there's still an un underlying objective reality underneath it all, and we're just trying to find out what it is. <laughs> I'm just glad my salvation doesn't depend on which interpretation I take. <laughs> Completely. You don't have to have everything exactly perfect for God to accept yeah, you. Right. We do look into a mirror dimly. <laughs> we do, yeah. Yeah. And love uh, co um, covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do try to limit what gets covered in my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think at this point I'll um, stop the recording because I have to stop it sometime. Uh, so officially, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, uh, I believe the meeting today was done in a far more amiable fashion than the previous one. <laughs> and um, um, so... Um, that was very pleasing to see the improvement in tone. So uh, thank you very much and um, for conducting an uh, amiable conversation. So I'll just stop the recording at this point.